Okay, so last time I got the read pixels working in my OpenGL example. Now I need to gear up the OpenGL example a little bit since I've stripped it down. I need to get a shader working in it and I want to be able to see some black pixels and white pixels in specific locations. Once I've got that, I've got all the basics I need to start experimenting a little bit and see if I can really get a grasp on when a fragment gets located in different pixels by moving vertices around in the like graphics OpenGL pipeline stuff. So that's what I'm going to try to do today, get from setting up all the shader stuff to playing around with that experimentation and see if I can wrap my head around this stuff in a more experiential way than I have before. Let's get into it. Okay, so I'm gonna pause here and I'm gonna go a slightly different direction. As I'm doing this, I'm getting this feeling that something isn't quite right because this Win32 OpenGL example that I have sitting around in my code base isn't really very useful for the kinds of things I wanna do with it. It's really a good example for how to bootstrap an OpenGL window and context, but I am gonna to have to set up all of this OpenGL sort of common stuff over and over again. And as I'm thinking about it, it would make more sense for me to have an OpenGL Scratch program that directly relies on my OpenGL uh, sort of definitions and functions stuff already and has some of my OpenGL helpers. And now this is gonna push me in the direction of doing a lot of organizing work that I was kind of hoping not to do first, but I think I can do a little bit of it and make this work and take some notes about how that suggests I should do organizing later. So what I'm gonna do is instead of doing a full organization now, I'm gonna just do enough organization to not have to make a huge mess out of my example just to have to clean it up later and lose all of the work again. Instead, I'm gonna set up a scratch OpenGL program that is not an example of how to bootstrap from scratch, but rather sort of a template of using my pre-existing OpenGL bootstrapper and helper functions for things like making shaders. And some of the things that's depending on might not be organized in quite the right way, but as I'm setting that up, maybe I'll learn some stuff about how I do want to organize it and put that onto my to-do list for later in this arc. And I won't waste my time setting up this example with a bunch of complex stuff that I'm just going to end up wanting to erase again later. That This way I'll still have my OpenGL example it's just how raw OpenGL bootstrapping works sitting around in the code base. But that'll be more for going to remember the OpenGL bootstrapping stuff if I ever need to write that in a separate piece of code. And the more uh, like scratch template-y work that I want to do in OpenGL, we'll be able to start from a better starting point where things like shader setup won't be this much work and I won't have to do it and undo it in future cases where I want to do this. So I'm going to try that direction instead. Hopefully that will be a little more effective and not create a huge mess. Let's try it.
Okay, so there's a very useful first step. I've got this little grid here that shows me a zoomed in version of whatever I render in the top left 10 by 10 block. I might want to move that later so that if I'm doing like animations, I can see the animation somewhere in a more convenient spot in the screen. But that's kind of how I'm going to do this is I'm going to start with this 10 by 10 block and look at how it affects the pixels by having this big zoomed in thing. And that's only a part of what I want. There is one other thing I want to do, which is I still want to be able to get the actual values. And since I don't have my font rendering system up and running in this example or the scratch base, I'm going to have to decide I either could get the font rendering up and running and just, you know, manually put down some numbers for the pixels that I'm interested in. Or I could, you know, on the first frame or something, uh, dump out all of that at like onto standard out, for instance, and then read the results in the buffer from four coder or something like that. Um, I'm going to try the second way first and see if that's good enough so that I can avoid what I, th I think it'll be more complicated to do the font rendering. So I'm going to try the four coder, uh, like standard out buffer thing first and see if that's good enough. Okay, that's awesome. That's giving me exactly what I was hoping for. I can just see the exact values of the red, green, and blue channels in my window dumped right out there onto the four coder buffer. And just glancing at it, I can see that this whole experiment is already giving me the kind of information that I wanted, which is that I thought I had set it up such that the top left corner of the geometry would be white. But when I look at it, it isn't actually pure white. This right here is showing me that I actually have, it's already interpolating the color a little bit. So my understanding of how the inputs are interpolated and controlled isn't quite good enough. There's some, some th details about how this stuff works that I was sort of oversimplifying in my head. And this is just direct numerical proof that, that what I was expecting is not matching what's actually coming out. So I think this is a good road. I'm going to go down this path a little bit more right now to see what I can learn by playing around and then maybe come up with some more specific experiments to disabuse myself of any other theory or any other hypotheses that I've been working under that aren't actually correct. But I'm not really sure where I want to go yet, so I'm going to start with a little bit of exploration and playing around with this to see what pops out. After doing all of that, I feel like I'm starting to get a good grasp on some of the things I didn't understand so well before. The first big discovery I've made is that I need to be more careful thinking about how interpolation along primitives works. To explain what I'm talking about more specifically, let's look at this example of a quad aligned to integer coordinates on this grid. The bottom of this quad is at coordinate number 4, so y equals 4 there, and at the top of the quad y equals 10. And I've also assigned a parameter, I'm calling it P, and at the bottom, parameter P is 0, and at the top, parameter P is 1. You can think of parameter P as something that we would interpolate along a primitive like a color or a UV coordinate or something like that. Going into all of this, I already knew OpenGL used the centers of pixels for the coordinates to test against a primitive. So in this case, the quad... Uh, that we're sending includes all of the pixels that have a yellow dot in their center in this image because it's using the center of each pixel and not say the bottom left or top right which might lead to stranger inclusion rules it's just simply the center of each pixel that gets tested and they're all clearly inside of the rectangle of course it'd be more accurate to say that the primitive is actually a pair of triangles and so the pixel centers are getting tested against that pair of triangles and it just so happens that the quad we're seeing on the screen is the emergent property of having these two triangles arranged next to each other sharing an edge. And I'm going to end up explaining this quality of interpolation that I came to appreciate by just looking at the rectangle picture, the simple quad, rather than at the full story with triangles. That would involve including barycentric coordinates and 
you know, setting up a third vertex and the X and Y and the P value for all three of those, you know, it'd be a little bit more involved. It'd be a complete picture, but it would have a bunch of details we don't actually need. The main insight makes sense just looking at the quad. So even though the quad is an oversimplification of how interpolation actually works, the key feature of what I discovered uh, that I was overlooking before still comes through just as clearly on the rectangle case as it would in the barycentric coordinate case. Now let's think specifically about what happens when the top left pixel gets its color. It uses the pixel center, so it's not the coordinate 10 or the coordinate 9, it's the coordinate 9.5 in the y direction. And we'll say that the along the x direction the p values aren't changing, so it's just as strong on the left as it is on the right. The p value remains 1 across the top, 0 across the bottom. So we don't need to know about x to do the interpolation, we just need to know about y. And so what happens when we try to interpolate P from one to zero at the coordinate Y equals 9.5? Well, the first step is a little math I call the Unlerp formula, where we take 9.5 minus four, that gives us what distance 9.5 is above four, and then we divide it by 10 minus four, that gives us the full range of how wide, or in this case, how tall the range is. And so we get the value between 0 and 1 that indicates how far we are along the line, where 0 would indicate we were at the bottom, and 1 would indicate we're at the top. right? And I could have flipped this and gotten the same result. I could have said that the top was 0 and the bottom was 1. This isn't P, by the way. This is T. It's the interpolation parameter. It's the thing we get when we unlerp 9.5 from the range 4 to 10. Now, once we have that, we can calculate P, and we calculate P by doing a linear interpolation from the two endpoints. Now, I picked 0 and 1 for P to make the calculation simpler, so it would just line up with T in this case to sort of show an emblematic version of the problem. But P could have been any two things, and this artifact would have popped out. And the artifact I'm talking about in particular is that this top line of pixels that actually shows up doesn't have P equals 1 as the value for P in those pixels, right? Because of the way interpolation works, p equals 1 at the very top edge, but at the pixel center, it equals 0 0.91666. And of course, the taller the rectangle gets or the shorter it gets, the more that would vary, or the way that would vary in different ways, I should say. So the point of this is that it's a little bit oversimplistic to think that when you send down a quad and set white as one color and black as another color, that you get a gradient that starts at white and ends up black. That's actually just not happening. Now, none of that means we couldn't make it a precise gradient. We could get a gradient that started on white and ended on black precisely, but we wouldn't be able to do it the way we're currently doing it, which it naively assumes that the color that goes on the fragments at the very edges of the primitives will be exactly the same color that we sent down as the actual UV or color value on the original vertices. The second thing I figured out is that the way OpenGL resolves pixel centers on the edges of a primitive is not as clearly defined as I would have thought. So obviously when a pixel center is fully contained inside of a primitive, then when that primitive gets drawn, that pixel gets filled. But what happens when we have a triangle that has an edge directly going through a pixel center? It turns out that the only thing OpenGL says about this case is that whatever solution is picked, it must be such that when two triangles are both sharing the same edge, but otherwise cover opposite parts of that edge, then only one of those two triangles should fill it, and exactly one of those two triangles should fill it. What that means is in a case where I have a quad made out of two triangles and the edge between those two triangles goes straight through a pixel center, it guarantees that exactly one of those two triangles will fill the pixel so that it doesn't leave a gap in the middle of my quad, and that only one of those two triangles will fill a pixel so that if something like alpha blending is happening, it doesn't get applied twice. So that is good to know, but the fact is OpenGL doesn't say which triangle it should be. It leaves that up to the implementation. So in my particular implementation, it turns out it's actually using a bottom left rule. If you go and look on this for the information that's online, a lot of people will claim it uses a top left rule. But that's actually not true. It uses a min-min rule. In other words, it uses the left edge and the bottom edge, or the smallest x coordinate and the smallest y coordinate, as the inclusive side. And this is in alignment with how DirectX does its 
triangle resolution. It is also doing min min, but for direct X, min on the Y axis is at the top, whereas on OpenGL, min on the Y axis is at the bottom. And this is of course just in my particular graphics card. So it might be that if you have a different card with a different driver, that it would behave differently here because as we just pointed out, OpenGL doesn't specify exactly how this should work. So when I'm going to do precision 2D graphics, this is something I need to keep in mind because if I'm placing any primitives on those pixel boundaries, on the, you know, the halfway point in the middle of a pixel, I can't really count on that looking a particular way that is consistent across every device. So those are all the big things I've come to understand from this round of experimentation. I think next time I'm ready to start looking at the specific things I was trying to get working before that were not working and seeing if I can do a better job at them now that I've figured out these details of how OpenGL works. So that's what we'll get to next time. See you then.